Okay, welcome back. This is Dr. Jin Sung. Today is Tuesday, 1230, and we'd like to continue on the topic of brain function. So last week we talked about the evils of gluten and dairy and how it affects brain function and looked at the physiology there. Today we'd like to uh, think about some basic things about brain function uh, that can be very helpful. So one thing is we need to be hydrated, right? We need to be fully hydrated. Uh, we can't be drinking soda, tea, and coffee and expect that to replace water uh, as your hydration fuel, right? You have to be drinking water. Coffee, tea, and those types of things are not the same in terms of physiology. So in terms of water uh, intake, you want to be able to take in at least half your body weight in ounces. So let's say you weigh uh, 150 pounds. So I weigh 150 pounds. And so at the minimum, I should be taking in half that amount in ounces. In order to do that, you have to drink that throughout the day, right? And you have to kind of work up to it. If you're not used to drinking a lot of water, sometimes it can be burdensome, right? You're going to run to the bathroom a lot and so forth. So in the beginning, you might want to work your way up. So don't go full on to half your body weight. Uh, just start slow, especially if you're drinking uh, small amounts of water currently. So minimum, a half your body weight in, in ounces, right? So, and then what you also want to do is, uh, if you're exercising, you want to include uh, a few additional ounces, anywhere from 10 to 20 ounces of water, depending on how active you are, uh, to supplement the water loss. You also want to give yourself electrolytes, minerals. Uh, I like to use a pink salt or an a ionic mineral supplement uh, to make sure you get full hydration and your cells are, uh, are fully hydrated. So water is very important for brain function. You have to be hydrated for the, water, uh, for the brain to work properly. The other big topic is sleep. There's a lot of people who do not sleep the allotted amount of time that they need. Uh, most people are so busy, so stressed, they, they forget that the sleep is a necessary component to one, healing, but two, optimal brain function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read off a few things for you and, and ask yourself, do I have those problems? Do I have these problems that affect my sleep? Okay? Because we, ideally you want to sleep a minimum of seven and a half to eight and a half hours of good quality sleep. And now uh, with work, with kids, with business and, and everything else that goes on in your life, it's quite difficult to do that, right? It's not easy to get good quality sleep with all the things or all the distractions that are occurring in our life, okay? So let's look at some common causes for sleep disturbance, all right? So the first thing is unstable blood sugar. If you have fluctuations in blood sugar, either too high or too low, it can affect sleep patterns. So you have to manage your blood sugar levels, right? You can't be too high. So we talked about fasting glucose above 100, uh, being insulin resistant. And if your fasting uh, blood sugar uh, in the morning is below 75, you might be hypoglycemic. So if you have these problems with blood sugar, it will definitely affect your sleep because it affects cortisol rhythm and cortisol output, okay? The other thing you gotta look at is gallbladder. Your gallbladder uh, will dump uh, um, you know, throughout the day with meals and so forth. Um, but if you have issues with uh, fat digestion, protein digestion, and you have a, a difficulty, time, uh, difficulty uh, sleeping through the night, it may be your gallbladder, it may be sluggish. I usually find gallbladder problems with people who have thyroid problems. Uh, Underfunctioning thyroid problems is, is a, um, a, a big problem in terms of the, the gallbladder removal surgeries that are occurring, right? There are so many women who have hypothyroid or Hashimoto's thyroiditis and they get their gallbladder removed because it becomes sluggish. It's like an organ that you don't need, they say, but it's, it's a very important uh, little organ that helps dump um, bile salts uh, into the intestine lining. It gets rid of your toxins. It gets rid of your heavy metals. 
is so crucial to overall health. So you gotta look at the gallbladder. The other is stomach problems. Do I have reflux disease, right? Do I have GERD? Uh, when you lie down at night, do you feel like it's coming up into your chest, right? Those are all signs and symptoms of reflux disease. Or you may have H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori, which is an infection of the GI tract causing reflux signs. So that needs to be managed also. Uh, parasites. Parasites is a, um, a topic that a lot of practitioners don't talk about uh, in terms of sleep. Um, but what I find is that people who have parasites in their GI tract will tend to wake up more at night. And that's because the parasites tend to be more active at night. So it, it kind of wakes that person up. It, it you know, increases their sympathetic uh, response. It increases their cortisol. So parasitic infections is, a, is another player in sleep disturbance. The other thing is overactive thyroid. Not in the terms of like a, uh, a Graves disease, which is a medical emergency, but people who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis will have up and down of their uh, thyroid hormones the waxing and waning of their symptoms. So sometimes they feel very cold and they feel like, oh, you know, my hair is falling out. And then the other times they can be hyperactive. Like I have so much energy, my hands are warm, uh, but I can't sleep. So um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is a player in terms of uh, sleep disturbance. The other thing is hormone balance. Hormone balance is a huge topic uh, for sleep because uh, a lot of women go through the fluctuations throughout the month when they're in their menstrual cycle, but especially when they go through that perimenopausal state or when they go into menopause, there's issues in terms of hormone fluctuation. And it's a big player in terms of sleep disturbance, right? You get the hot flashes at night, you sweat, and so forth. And it's not necessarily the hormones that are, let's say, lacking, but it's more of the problem of the balance, right? Your estrogen progesterone balance that creates issues with um, hot flashes. So when you get into menopause, what happens is the hormones that are somewhat produced in the ovaries, and right, um, the, your adrenal glands have to take up the slack. So your adrenal gland goes, hey, I have to pick up the slack because my ovaries are no longer working. And if your adrenals are not in shape, or at optimal function, then you're gonna have a lot of signs and symptoms, right? So if you have hormonal fluctuations or in that perimenopausal or menopausal state, it can create uh, significant uh, problems with sleep. The other thing is neurotransmitter balance. So if you have GI dysfunction, you have issues with your serotonin and GABA, uh, hormone production, uh, neurotransmitter production, it can create problems with sleep. So neurotransmitters are very important because really that, that is your messenger uh, uh, to, from your nerve, nervous system outwards. So you need proper hormonal and neurotransmitter function for it to work. The other thing is a, the pineal gland, which is a small gland in the brain. And it's important uh, for uh, melatonin production, uh, and modulation of your hormones throughout sleep. Uh, one of the big players for, for the uh, pineal gland is electromagnetic frequencies. So if you have a lot of uh, frequencies around you, or even light, like using your tablet at night or your phone at night, you can create disturbances in that pineal gland. So it's very important that you turn off your phones. Uh, we also, we just talked about the adrenal glands and the hormones uh, for, for women. Uh, in that perimenopausal and menopausal states. The other thing is inflammation. We talked about inflammation uh, before, but inflammation in the brain can create havoc in terms of overall brain function. So it's, an, it's, it's important to modulate that uh, inflammation or find the source of the inflammation to control it, okay? So all those things that I just talked about are things that um, you may be able to handle to a certain extent, um, but what I find is we need to kind of go deep and digging uh, into the underlying causes for us to help you uh, fix those uh, underlying sleep issues. So it's not something that's very um, simple in nature. Uh, you may need some help doing that. 
So I'm going to give you some simple tips um, that might help you um, sleep better. Okay, so I'm just going to read off a list so I won't forget here. So one thing is, is avoid carbohydrates uh, and snacks, uh, especially grains and sugars, before bed, right? Because it's going to affect your sleep pattern. Um, you can eat a high protein snack before bed, but not sugary things. Sleep in complete darkness. That means get rid of um, those alarm clocks, the electronic uh, alarm clocks where it kind of blinks or it's kind of bright in the room. Get rid of the TV, get rid of your cell phone, your tablets. You gotta sleep in complete darkness, okay? No TV right before bed. Um, Sometimes women or, or men who have cold hands and feet, they might be better off wearing some socks at night so that uh, in the middle of the night their, their hands and feet do not go too cold because that may wake you out of your sleep also. Uh, obviously you want to be able to meditate and re uh, read something more spiritual at night that will help you sleep also better. Uh, if, you're, if you're laying up at, uh, waking up at night or laying in your bed and not being able to sleep because your mind is kind of racing, you want to think about journaling. So write down some of your thoughts before bed. Therefore, you can kind of have it on paper rather than kind of play it over in your mind over and over again. Okay. The other thing is go to bed as early as possible so you can actually fall asleep at the appropriate time. Um, um, the other thing is avoid caffeine, obviously, late in the afternoon. All electrical devices outside of the room, you don't want it in the room, right? It doesn't matter um, if, you have, uh, if you have the TV um, off, but we really want all the electronic products out of that room that you're sleeping in, and you should be sleeping in total darkness. Um, avoid alcohol um, before bed. You also want to be able to uh, take a hot shower maybe before bed, that will also be helpful. Um, the other thing is exercise. So you want to be able to exercise um, every day, but don't exercise just before bed when you have sleep issues, right? You can't go to the gym after work, work out from eight to nine, and then come home and expect to sleep by 10. So you want to be able to um, get the proper uh, exercise earlier on um, that will help your cortisol production and so forth um, and help you sleep throughout the night. So the best time to really exercise is actually at the lowest point of your day. So if you're a person who uh, wakes up in the morning is, and is fatigued and having problems getting out of bed, that might be the time to just get up and do uh, 50 jumping jacks, 20 push-ups, and 50 sit-ups. Because that increase in uh, blood flow and energy at the time of when you're most tired will help you produce cortisol at those low times. So morning is a good time to do uh, the exercises. Sometimes just around that mid-afternoon where everyone gets a little tired, that might be another good time to do some exercises. And we're not talking about exercise where you have to do like you know two hours of training. We're talking short, short bursts, maybe 15 to 20 minutes of exercise where you can get the butt, uh, blood pumping and a, a little bit of a sweat going and that will help you sleep at night, all right? I'd like to thank everyone last week who signed up um, and liked our page and shared our information. Uh, it's been a great experience. Um, I'd like uh, everyone to uh, share it with their friends and family because we like to give usable tips every week um, that can improve your health, all right? So we'll see you next week on the healthy side. Take care.